Okay, do we have everybody? I think we do. Is it starting time, Liz? It is starting time. Yeah, it's starting time. Yeah. Welcome. I'm Jonathan. It's very nice to be here at the, uh, the Dutch Pool Workshop once again. I've missed this for the last couple of years, and uh, it's very good to be back. So uh, today I've got to talk for you on reactive programming. This is something I found very exciting over recent years. It's something that I've been uh, bringing to the world of Tel 6 over the last uh, year or so, and uh, there's a lot of very exciting stuff to talk about. Now, the topic really that I want to address today is the way we deal with asynchronous stuff, okay? What do we mean by asynchronous stuff? I mean data that just arrives when it damn pleases. So we're talking about UI events, okay? We don't get to choose when the user clicks the button or types in the text box. They will do it whenever they feel like. Um, we're talking about things like web requests, okay? If we're a server, the web request will arrive whenever the user makes the web request, and we don't really have much choice in the matter. Um, if we're making web requests ourselves, the response will come back, you know, whenever it feels like it. Um, we have all kinds of other sources of asynchronous data too. Um, you know, things like file change notifications. Okay, so I can get my operating system to tell me, oh, you changed that file. Um, I better, you know, notify you of this change. Um, things like timers. Okay, something that ticks every second. Tick, tock. Tick, tock, okay? We want to do something for that. Unix signals. All of these are things that just happen. And uh, dealing with them is, is kind of fun. Um, especially when you start getting multiple sources of them. Because when you start getting multiple sources of asynchronous data, you get into all of these interesting synchronization problems. All of these problems where you want to make sure that you're not maybe doing two things at the same time, and you get really horrible things. Um, look at this little autocomplete thing here. Okay, this is what people uh, apparently search for on, on Google. I'm a little concerned about the second one, um, but I'm glad more people want to do it than the first. Anyway, um, basically, uh, what can happen with these things if you ever implemented one of them is, you know, the user types something, and you send off a HTTP request. Okay, and uh, you know, on the server it starts thinking about this, and uh, then the user changes what they've typed, so you send off another HTTP request. And it turns out that this second one gets an answer really, really fast. Okay, maybe you hit a different server that's less loaded, or something like that. So when you get back the results of this, this latest thing the user typed, and you update the data that is uh, there in the, drive, the little drop down, and everything is really good. And then, the, uh, the first web server, that you contact, it comes back, gives you more results, okay? And uh, what do you do? Well, if you haven't programmed it carefully, what you're gonna do is end up replacing the latest data in terms of, you know, what the, the user wants to see with the data that you just got back uh, from this, this older request. And uh, dealing with all of these sorts of things gets really kind of fun and tricky. Um, now, you might wonder, am I going to be talking about threads in all of this? And the answer is, well, sometimes they may be involved, yes. Um, if you kick a bit of work off on another thread to do it in the background, perhaps because you're building a shiny user interface and our users expect responsive applications now, okay, they don't expect that they say, do this, and then the UI freezes up for like 10 seconds and they're like, I hate your application, okay, we don't want that. So we shove work off onto other threads, um, but that data comes back whenever it likes. Um, and the user might be doing something else when it comes back, and we need to deal with all the synchronization issues there. Um, so there's, there's lots and lots of things to worry about when we start doing asynchronous programming. And uh, generally the reaction traditionally to this is, ah, okay, or maybe more like, ah. So, before we try and take this on, let's talk a little bit about something more familiar and how we deal with the problems that it, uh, it gives us and factor things. This is the one bit of Perl 5 in my talk. It's, uh, it's a while loop, reading a file. I hope it's correct. I don't write much of this anymore. But uh, the thing to note about this is that it basically is going through the file line by line. At some point, you know, we will block, maybe we'll be waiting for the disk, okay, to slowly churn around and give us some more data much slower than the CPU. Um, so, the real pattern at the heart of this is what we call the iterator pattern. Okay, we, we have this data and we're working our way through it step by step by step, line by line by line, in the case of a line-based file. Um, now, 
if we consider um, lists of things, um, you know, if we're working with arrays or lists, we don't just have to do it all by writing loops and if statements and doing the normal imperative programming stuff. As we tend to get a little bit more you know, skilled as developers, we start reaching to what we call slightly higher order tools. Um, things like map. Okay, so in map, if you think about what map is doing, it's basically creating a new array, doing a for each loop, running your piece of code, okay, and uh, then just, just showing the results of that, that code block into the new array. And that's what a map does. A grep is kind of similar, apart from there's an if there. These things factor the flow of control out of our code. And uh, we, we kind of like that, uh, I guess, and we, you know, we, we maybe go using them. Uh, actually, we like these a real lot in Pel6, and we've got a whole bunch more of them. Let me walk you through this example. Uh, we're getting the gold members of, say, our frequent flyer program. And then uh, what I'm doing is I'm grepping out those who have more than uh, 10,000 points. And uh, that startup point syntax there basically is uh, creating us a little closure. Okay, so uh, that's like a dollar underscore uh, dot points. Um, but uh, without writing a dollar underscore. And it actually realizes that it should drag that uh, greater and operator into the, the whole thing as well. So you, you basically get a little closure in there. Um, so anyway, uh, even forgetting that, it's, it's fairly clear, I think, what, uh, what it's trying to achieve. Um, then we've got a whole bunch of entrants to our little competition. We pick 10 of them. That's just grabbing 10 at random. Okay, they're our winners. And then we just use math to grab the name of each of those, those winners. Um, now, uh, you know, that's, that's fairly nice. And you might say, well, how does this relate to the iterator pattern? And the answer is, well, uh, in full 6, our lists are lazy. Meaning that you can actually have a, an array and work through it a piece of the time, or an element of the time. In fact, you can even have infinitely long lists. For example, that is an infinite list of the Fibonacci numbers. Um, now, of course, uh, we don't have enough memory to store infinite lists. Um, so, you know, uh, this is a little challenging, um, but you'll notice then that I've actually used the bind operator, okay, which is your hint that something a little bit unusual is going on. Um, now, one of the big gotchas when you start putting laziness into programming languages is people don't expect things to go executing later than they kind of intuitively think they will. Um, so, for that reason, we've typically kept assignment as being what we call mostly eager. Um, meaning that you know we, we don't sort of randomly go and uh, just say oh we can't be bothered to execute this bit of code till later and then sort of catch everyone out because they wrote side effects everywhere um, you know we don't expect pull programmers to be sort of Pascal level purity or something um, but uh, when we do on that we we go and stick our, our colon in there and what that means is I just want to talk about this list and then I can go and grep it okay and I'm not actually doing any work here in this grep all I'm saying is I would like to set up a thingy, now if I ask it for values, we'll grab values from fibs, which is a sequence, okay, at the, the numbers 1, 1, 1 plus 1 is, you know, 2, uh, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus, uh, ah, sorry, 2 plus 3 is 5, okay, and so on. Um, and uh, we're just grabbing those out there, and we're just indexing into it, we're getting numbers up to 10. That's actually syntax for a range, okay, 0, dot, dot, 9. And, uh, you're kind of looking at this and you're saying, well, okay, that's kind of nice because it means that uh, we, we can talk about infinitely long sequences of things, but just, you know, consider the ones we care about. Uh, the only problem being, of course, that you're like, well, what the hell, I'm a real programmer, I never use the Fibonacci numbers in my programs. Uh, why do I care about this? Okay, well, that's a really good question. The reason you might care about this is because we can do this with files. So you can actually write a for loop, okay, <coughs> over a file handle, grabbing in its lines, uh, you can even grab it like this, and it's not going to pull the whole thing into memory. It's just going to let us step a line at a time, filter out the ones that start with comments, okay, and put each one into dollar line. You'll see that the, the variable goes over here in Pulse X. We got rid of some of the parens, okay, but uh, what we're doing there is it's just going through the lines of the file. And uh, that's kind of nice. That's a much more practical use of laziness. And uh, it means we can, we can now actually just go and start grepping, um, you know, however long lines that we get from files without having to care if it's a really big file. We can just work through it a bit at a time. So, one of the things that you know about all of these things is that they factor out flow control. Okay, they sort of take this, 
this sort of looping, this uh, conditional stuff, and they drag it out of our code, and they let us just write it once. And of course, for Mac and Grep, it's not a lot of code. For things like pick, where you want to pick 10 things at random, but without duplicates, uh, there's some sort of harder math in there. But then we get to things like unique. Unique filters out duplicates. Inside of unique, by the way, the as is just specifying the, uh, the thing I want to make unique in all of them. So here I've got a bunch of, say, search results from Google and Bing. And uh, I want to just make sure I get unique ones. I want to toss the overlaps. Okay, so if they both gave the same URL back to something, we'll uh, we'll just have it in the results once. But uh, the thing about this is that inside of unique, there's actually a hash, and uh, it's going and it's storing the you know the the things that we already saw. And uh, that one is actually dragging not only flow control out of that code, but also state. So we don't have to think about all of that, you know, those variables. I mean, we, we talk a lot about, you know, global variables are bad. Why are they bad? Well, because they can change everywhere. Uh, so then we try and put things into classes and make them attributes. Um, but of course, we don't make things an attribute if a local will do. We don't declare a local at the start of a subroutine if it's just needed in one if block. We do all of these things because actually state makes programs harder to read. Uh, when we start using things like, say, unique, where we can just talk about, oh, I want a unique list of these things, we get to get the state and uh, you know, hide it away and uh, not have to care about it quite so much. Now, one of the things that you know, I kind of got thinking about all of this is, uh, what if we could do this for, uh, react for uh, you know, asynchronous data? Okay? All of the, uh, the stuff that we've talked about so far is synchronous. So when I had the list of the Fibonacci numbers, you know, I'm, I'm sort of down on my knees like, give me another Fibonacci, okay? And uh, slowly my program gives me them. And it's the same with the files. I'm there begging the file system for more and more data and lines of the file off disk. And uh, if it you know, isn't quite ready yet, I have to sit there and wait, okay, and blocking. And uh, databases are like this as well. You go and you sit waiting, okay, waiting, waiting. And that's the very nature of synchronous programming and synchronous data. Yeah, you know, we ask for it, we wait for it, we get it. But asynchronous data is different. It's this data that can just come and occur any time. And one of the things that we might wonder is, uh, you know, is there a way that we can perhaps, you know, take some of these ideas and, uh, you know, factor out the complexity. So we can do asynchronous programming, but just like where we've synchronous programming of lists of data, we use things like grep and map and unique to, to not have to talk about the exact details of what we want. Now, what if I could do a grep on a stream of data that's just being thrown at me? Okay, what if I could take a bunch of mouse clicks and just grep out the left clicks? Okay. That's kind of an intriguing idea, because if we can do that, then you know, we, we can drag the complexity out of, of things. Um, we can hopefully bring together different sources of asynchronous data. I mean, we know there's things we can do with a list to, to bring them together. If I have two lists, I can zip them. Okay? I can make one result list which contains pairwise combinations of the other two. So you know, if I have two sets of numbers in uh, two lists, I can you know, maybe take them and, and add each number pairwise together and get a single result list out. That's a, that's a zip operation. Um, so, uh, you know, there's lots of ways of doing that with synchronous lists. Maybe we can do that with asynchronous ones too. That would be really nice. Um, and, you know, in theory, if we can tackle all of these things, we might even be able to get to the point where things that feel complex, like taking a piece of work, getting it done on another thread, and updating your user interface in a safe way with the result, um, that sort of thing might actually be kind of made easy. So there's all kinds of, of possible, you know, little benefits we could get. Probably some other crap as well, okay? But um, the thing is, um, now how, how can we get there? Well, some years ago, um, this joke's only funny if you know Spire and Category Theory. That's a very select audience, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, category theory is this really strange bit of mathematics. I've actually got a friend who's reading a lot of category theory at the moment. Um, and it's kind of a thin line whether he's still sane or not, I'm never quite sure. Um, he sort of tells me things about, you know, the, the endofunctors of a monad, and I'm just like, yeah, let's go drink beer. But uh, anyway, um, this apparently can give some quite nice insights. And one of the things it's really good at is revealing relationships between things that we maybe hadn't realized before. 
Several years back, a bunch of very smart guys, Eric Meyer amongst them, um, basically realized that there's a relationship, a very deep one, between iterators, that is, things we use in synchronous programming, you know, with lines, give me another line, give me another line, okay, and uh, observers. What are observers? Well, the observer pattern is where you go to something like, say, a text box, and you say, here's a piece of code, call it back whenever the text in the text box changes. Okay, and whenever we change that bit of text in the text box, we get a notification. Okay, so the thing that we're observing, we call an observable, just like a thing you can iterate, we call an iterable. And, uh, you know, the thing we get is an iterator, well, the thing that gets called back is an observer. It's observing the changes to the text box. And if you think about it, that's asynchronous, okay? The observer doesn't have any choice about when it gets called. It's all about the text box saying, oh, hey, I got some text. Ooh, I'll better, you know, call my observers and tell them. It's all asynchronous. And what they realize is that uh, these two are, uh, they call them categorical jewels. Um, now, without getting into what that means, because they'd really rather not, um, the, the, the big result that comes out of this is that anything you can sensibly define in terms of iterators, you can also sensibly define in terms of observables. That means that deep down in the math, there's something telling us that, yes, we can do map on a list, but we can also do map on an observable. We can do grep, we can do unique, we can do squish, we can do all of these different things. That's kind of exciting, because what it unveiled was that we, we actually can deal with asynchronous data okay, in a very kind of familiar way. Um, we can use a lot of the same mechanisms that we used to for dealing with synchronous data. They call this reactive programming. And uh, synchronous programming got recoined as interactive programming, okay? Um, but uh, that one kind of got ignored. So uh, reactive programming is the term that we, we pretty much always use to describe this kind of thing, okay? It's essentially programming where stuff happens and other things react to it as a result. So uh, let's actually get into the, the practicalities of doing this. So in Perl 6, we have a type called supply. A supply is something that you can observe. And uh, essentially, you tap the supply. Okay, It's a little like a beer barrel. And when you want a beer, you go and you know open the tap, and the uh, nice stuff flows out. Okay, And later, of course, your glass might be full, so then you, you hopefully close the tap. Um, and uh, it kind of works in exactly the same way here. So here I have a supply. Okay. And uh, this actually is the interval supply. It's something that gives me a tick every time interval, uh, every second in this case. Now, what I can do with that is I can take this little tick and I can uh, just uh, tap it and I can just say, oh, we started double underscore seconds ago. And uh, actually what that's going to do is it's just going to start at 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., once per second. Okay. So, the thing about this is that uh, because it's just a, a set of observables, we can map it. And the thing to realize about this map is that uh, what we're actually doing is we're mapping the future. Okay? We're talking about a map on things that haven't happened yet. Um, and what happens is the flow control goes the opposite direction. This is very typical of jewels. The way jewels work is you return, you basically separate, uh, sorry, swap around your inputs and your outputs. Okay. So what happens here is that uh, every time you get a tick, okay, then the map is run, and the, the result of the map is then pushed on downwards. In this case, into this say. Okay, I just grab the say function there, and uh, so what happens is we we uh, we get a zero in, we get tick, okay, talk, tick, talk, etc. Um, so uh, well. And we, we map it. So, fine. Um, this looks, looks kind of interesting. Um, one thing you might wonder at this point is, um, you know, how does that, that interval thing work? Does it involve threads in any way? Um, the answer is that yes, that one does. Um, when you get that callback, that little say there, okay, this is actually all running off on a, a thread pool. So, uh, yeah, we have real threads, and uh, you know, that, that one goes off. This, on the other hand, does not. There's sort of a principle of minimum concurrency. 
So here I create a uh, supply. Okay, you don't have to obtain one from something like Interval or one of the many, many other factories for them. You can actually just create one. And uh, you can just start spewing data out on it. You call more, say, here's another bit of data, here's another bit of data. Okay? And there's also done and quit, which I'll put aside for now. Um, but uh, what we can do is we can just tap that. And uh, as many things can tap it as they want. And what will happen is every time I push a, uh, in this case, a Chime and a Jubel down to this, okay, it'll just run that, uh, that, uh, that little block there. Okay? Now, this doesn't actually involve any threading at all. Um, it doesn't just go and magically introduce it just because I started using a supply. Okay, so this is not necessarily about threading. Um, and there's not going to be threads introduced for you just, just magically. Um, you actually have to use something that, for example, involves time, where we actually, you know, you're going to go and get on with stuff, and then we're going to have these ticks coming through um, to, to actually uh, start getting into to having threads. Okay, so that was a um, just some you know introduction to what we can do. But what I want to do for the rest of the session is just walk you through building two sort of slightly more real world things using reactive programming. Now, uh, who uses Git? Yes, Git is awesome. I love Git. Okay, I actually get to teach Git as well. It's a, it's a fun job. Um, the nice thing about teaching Git, by the way, is it's got one really simple data structure at the heart of it. Uh, you can explain everything in terms of that. That's always a good system design. So, uh, one of the things that you know, I like about Git is that you basically can't lose stuff. You know, once you give something to it, it's essentially immutable. You might lose a reference to it, but then you could go and recover it somehow later on. And it's very hard to actually lose your stuff. However, um, that only applies once you've told Git about your stuff, once you've committed your stuff. What happens in the in-between time? Or I change stuff, and uh, you know, um, maybe I, you know, I do something I regret. Uh, you know, say I do a change, and then I, I somehow wipe it out, and I can't get it back. And it might almost be nice just to have something that, you know, between commits, just makes me little backups. So I built one. Let me just go and uh, demo it to you. So uh, what I'll do, I, I'm actually in a, a Git repository here, and. Uh, when I, I just pull this thing up, it tells me the way that I can use it. What I'll do is I'll just uh, tell it to watch, and that tells it that I, I want it to watch the current directory. Now, uh, what I'll then do is I'll just go and uh, we'll, we'll actually create a, a file. This is going to be extremely creative. Oops. Echo. There we go. Okay. And if I just go and look over here, it tells me that it's back to bar. Um, actually, I, it did it twice because I, uh, I touched the file the first time and uh, then again. Uh, what other files have I got in here? I think I've got a... Oh, there's an XP6. Okay, let's uh, just, uh, just put something into that as well. Okay, and uh, yeah. Echo. 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 It's, uh, I didn't do enough coffee today, apparently. So uh, what I can then say is uh, intercommit list. And uh, what it will tell me is that there's these, uh, these four things that it's recorded, and I can then uh, intercommit show, uh, say, two, okay, and it will say, oh, that was foo. And uh, if I was to go and now make a, a git commit of xp6, okay, and uh, some awesome message, oh, it's awesome, I type of it. Great. Um, what we should notice over here is that it noticed that head moved, okay, I committed, so it's gone and cleared away my backups. So, uh, well, this seems kind of nice. So, uh, how do we build it? All modern operating systems provide us with what we call I.O. notifications. That is, they tell us when something changed. If you think about it, this is an asynchronous source of data. And, uh, we actually expose this in Peltex. There's an I.O. notification class. You can say watch path. If you give it a file, it'll just tell you when that file changes. If you give it a directory, it will tell you about directories in that fi ah, files in that directory that change. Okay? Um, so uh, what I can do is I can, to actually uh, deal with detecting commits, if you know a little bit about Git, you'll know that whenever head moves, you update the ref log, okay? which is in the Git logs head. So what I'm going to do is uh, just uh, tap, okay, the, uh, the the file system notifications, and uh, we can just say oh, a commit, okay.
Okay, and what that will do is every time I do a git commit now, or actually move my head around, it will uh, it will come and uh, just just say this message. So uh, what do I want to do now? Well, uh, what I can actually do is just uh, tap that. Okay, and uh, instead of saying a message, what I'll do is I'll simply uh, get the directory listing, and I'm using this dot intercommit directory to keep my my backups. And all I'm going to do in dot intercommit is I'm uh, I'm just going to loop over the files. I'm going to unlink them. Okay, and uh, that that just lets me uh, get rid of those. So that's how I can just toss the, the the stuff, and I'm doing it just as I get notified. So what about the files themselves? Well. Uh, let me just talk a little bit more about what this thing does. Um, when I actually watch a path, I, I don't just get a list of file names, I actually get objects telling me the nature of the change. So I can see that here, the path was awesome.p6, the event was uh, a file changed event. Uh, you can actually get renamed ones as well, and things like that. So uh, what's going on in here is, uh, you know, we're just able to, to tap them and say them. But of course, what we want to do is a little more interesting than that. So. Uh, one of the problems that you get into if you actually start doing this is that um, operating systems really suck at this. I mean, they're, they're awful. Um, on Windows, if I change a file once, I get two notifications. Why? Well, because some deep reason that I shouldn't have to care about, but that's how they implemented it. Okay? And these notifications arrive within like, you know, 0.05 seconds of each other. You know, it's really annoying. They just show up together. Now, of course, this is silly because I don't want to make two backups of the file just because the operating system thought that it you know, should tell me twice about the same thing. How do we deal with this? Well, uh, we can actually uh, unique them. Okay, we saw this function on lists earlier. And we can unique them by path. Okay, so there's nothing new. Now it turns out that because asynchronous things often have a notion of time involved, there's various extra options that we put on to some of these various methods when you're dealing with a supply rather than a list. One of the ones that we have put on uh, unique is actually expires. What expires will do is that it will basically give you a unique one once per that time unit, in this case one second. So if I get, you know, say I have two files, let's call them foo and bar, because we really imagined. Okay? So I change foo, okay, and bar, I'm in my editor, okay, and I save all. So I save the two of them. So they both get written out to disk. Um, now, Windows being stupid tells me twice about each of them. Okay? Um, but what will happen is that the first foo will come in, we'll get into here, and uh, what it will do is it will look at the path and it will say, oh, you've already seen, uh, oh, we haven't seen this in the last second. Okay, it spits it out. Uh, the second notification for foo comes in, it says, oh, we just saw that within the last second. No, I won't bother spitting that out again. Okay, but if we were to save it again, like five seconds later, it would say, oh, uh, I forgot about the fact I already saw foo. So uh, I'll let it through. What you'll kind of note about that is that uh, that's a, a not quite trivial thing to do. Now, there's something that makes this even less trivial, which is not necessarily very apparent. Which is that IO notifications get shoved onto the thread pool. And uh, what that means is that there's a whole bunch of threads that are happy to react to these different notifications. So that's kind of nice in that we can make use of our shiny multi core CPUs, which are getting more cores by the year. Um, but it also means that there's a real risk that you know, two notifications come in, two different threads are processing them, and uh, what happens to the hash inside of here? It's not just that we managed to factor out state and flow control. In all of these things, very often what we're also factoring out is synchronization, okay, and thread safety. We're taking it out of your code and basically solving a whole bunch of these things inside of these, these methods. <coughs> Let's take a look at um, dealing with the, the actual backups. How do we do this? Well, for the backups, what we're going to do is we're going to watch the path. We've got a little bit more work to do. We're going to do the unique trick again, okay, just to get rid of any dupe notifications. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to map the, the object, and I'm just going to map out the path. That's the only piece that I care about. Okay? So I map out the path, looking good. Now I'm going to grep to make sure that I don't back up the backup directory, because that would be really silly. 
Then I tap it, okay, and in here I've got a state variable, we just increment it. We, uh, there's a very nice function called spurt, which is an inverse slurp, okay, it just shoves something out to a file. Um, spurt can, it was the least disgusting word we could find, like spew is worse, spit is even worse. Spurt mostly works unless you, well, yeah, let's not go there. Anyway, um, the nice thing about spurting is that um, you can append, okay? So uh, when you do that, basically it takes that file and just shows whatever you give it at the end of it. So that's, that's perfect for us. We can write the change ID and the, uh, the file name, and we just do the copy of the file. Now, if you're looking at this carefully, you might actually come up with one concern based on what I told you, which is that uh, multiple threads can, can basically be dealing with two, re two of these notifications at once. And sometimes that's not a problem. This time it is because I have this little state variable here. I'm appending to this file. I don't want to get this all screwed up. So what I'm actually going to do is uh, just notice when I have this state. And uh, when you're doing side effecty things, and dot tap is not what you want. Um, if you're actually going to do something where there's, there's data involved, and that uh, you're going to, to be competing over potential of a thread and the, the responding to the same kind of event, um, use act. Okay? This actually makes sure to do them one after the other. Um, the act is actually meant to mind you of actor, as in the actor pattern, um, which might help you if you know what it is and won't help you at all if you don't. Okay, but uh, basically what's going on here is it, it's making sure that we're only in this piece of code once at a time. So we back up the files one after the other, and uh, that solves our problems. So, that's how we, uh, we get to our backup program. Um, factoring wise, all I did is I just uh, actually created myself a class and put the two things into a pair of private methods. I also decided I wanted a log of what's going on. You saw that log. Let me just pull it up again. Okay, you saw that there. And uh, that log is actually also a supply. Um, what I've got in the main entry point of my program, okay, we, uh, here's the main sub. Um, this is how we tell it, you know, this is the multi. This is how we tell it and we, uh, we want to, to respond to watch being passed as an argument to the program. Uh, it's just a sanity check, we're in a git directory. Okay, we make that directory, that's all boring. But here what I do is I make my new intercommit watcher and then I just take the log and I tap it, I pass say there, and then the main thread is just going to sleep. Okay, it doesn't need to do anything, everything's going to be happening off over uh, in the threads. So, uh, that's, that's basically it. And uh, the whole program, if we just go, ooh, that's not the right file. I was doing dominance calculations. Okay, um, this is uh, the class, okay? And uh, you can see there's the, the overwatch. And uh, down here, there's the, the one I just showed you. And there's actually these two other uh, candidates for uh, list and show. Um, and uh, what they are telling the, uh, the thing is that we, uh, we only want to react to uh, the list being passed. You may remember I, I did uh, intercommit uh, list, intercommit show. Okay. And uh, you can actually, you might say, where is that, uh, that nice usage message when I, uh, when I type that? Uh, the answer is it's generated automatically based on the, the main subroutines that I wrote. So uh, there's just a, an aside bit of shiny for you. Okay, so uh, that wasn't too bad, but uh, it was a bit of a cop out because we only had one source of asynchronous data. Okay, we only had file notifications. And I, I sort of told you that we could sort of deal with those in a, in a, a nice way with this, and we kind of did. But I want to sort of just step it up a bit for this, this final example and talk to you about what happens when we have, say, three different kinds of asynchronous data. And uh, what I actually have in uh, this case is I'm going to have user <coughs> interface events, I'm going to have timers, and I'm actually going to do background computation on a thread. Okay, I'm going to do all three of them. Now, uh, I had this, uh, you know, the idea of making this, this really silly application. It's a code golf assistant. Okay, so what happens is uh, you type your code in here. Okay. And uh, then, uh, this little character count, as you type, okay, more characters, it tells you how long your golf is, okay, so you're trying to get the code as short as possible, that's code golfing, okay, trying to solve the problem in the fewest possible characters. 
Um, of course, I want to know how much time I've wasted in my life golfing this code, so here is an elapsing number of seconds, which I want to count up every second. <laughs> now, as I type this in, um, suppose it takes like you know a second to actually figure the thing out. I don't want my user interface to freeze, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to run this piece of code on a background thread, evaluate, okay, and then just pop the results into this text box here. So uh, that's quite a lot of things going on. There's three different sources of asynchronous data. There's the user typing the stuff here. There's these ticks from the timer. And uh, then we're going to have to deal with a thread asynchronously telling us it got done with the work we asked it to do. <coughs> now, when I wanted to show you this, I had a small problem. Uh, because I realized on the way here that no one actually had done a, a GTK uh, library in Pulse XJ. We got SDL and all of those. So I, ha I had like an eight-hour train journey to get here. Um, so I actually wrote a, a GTK symbol on the way. Um, so uh, it doesn't handle all the controls yet, but hey, it does this one. All right. So um, here is how we set the user interface up. Okay, I like simple APIs. So uh, there's not too much going on in here. All I do is I make a new app. It's the title of it. And all I'm going to do is uh, just create a. Uh, the way GTK works is that it basically uses these these boxing things to lay things out. That's a vertical box, which means shove things one below the other. So uh, what I want to have is my source code text box, okay? And uh, then I want to have a label, saying the number of characters. I want to have a label for the amount of time that has elapsed. And I want to have a text box where I will show the results of executing the code, okay? So uh, I'm just putting each of those into a variable because that gives me a nice way to refer to it later. Now. Here is how we deal with taking changes to the text box and updating that label. Now, all events in this module that I've written are exposed as supplies. Okay, that means you can just tap the changed event supply. You can then set the text of that child's label just to say characters, and we just grab the number of characters that are in the text box. Okay, it's not bad. So uh, let's step it up a bit. What about the elapsed time. Here we have to be careful. And the reason we have to be careful is that uh, here is my interval ticking away. And uh, the problem I've got with it, of course, is that this is running on the thread pool. And if you update user interfaces from thread pools, things get really, really unhappy. And then your application explodes very badly. So uh, what I uh, basically have here is a uh, little thing called a GTK simple scheduler. Um, a scheduler is something where you give it a bit of work and it figures out somewhere to execute it. The GTK simple scheduler basically takes a piece of work and hooks in to the event loop of GTK and makes sure you run it on the user interface thread so the update is thread safe and it doesn't conflict with other user interface operations. So the way we use that is we just take our event source, our intervals here, we say schedule it on the GTK symbol <coughs> scheduler that basically takes this flow of seconds, shoves them over onto the user interface thread, and uh, makes uh, this update work out. Okay, that's two pieces of functionality down, one to go. So, uh, of course, the stupid way to do it is whenever the, uh, the text box changes, okay, we give out the code. Now, that sucks in two ways. The first is the user's typing away. And we don't want to eval the code for every single keystroke. We want them just to hesitate for a moment, and then we'll do it. The second thing is that we don't want to do this on the UI thread because it'll freeze up the user interface. So, the first problem is solved using unchanged. Unchanged basically waits for the data to be stable for a time period, then passes it along. Okay, so if I keep typing, keep typing, stop for a second, put one there, and uh, then it says, okay, now I'll pass it along. So that lets me get a stable value. Okay, another nice tricky problem that's factored away into one of these methods. Now, what about getting it done on a thread? Threads are dangerous, and I mean, you know, how do we, we deal with this? And you can sort of see the problem coming. There's not just that we need to get the user interface update done on the right thread, there's also the problem um, that uh, what if the user types something, we start evaluating it, Okay, and then uh, they type something else. The second thing runs quicker. Okay, it's the problem I described earlier of autocomplete. So we call start 
This is the way that we get a bit of work shoved off onto the fretboard. Okay, so we eval the code. But this does something clever. It gives me back a, not just a supply, but a supply of other supplies. Okay, now that's a bit of a headache when you first see it, but let me show you why this is really nice. We have something called migrate. Migrate moves its way between a set of different supplies. So whenever a new one arrives, it says, this is my latest source of events. It ignores all the previous ones, and it therefore solves the problem. Okay, so we're taking the text box, we're saying, let it be unchanged for a second, then start evaluating the code on a different thread, migrate between the various different evaluations, so we only ever care about the latest one, schedule uh, updating things on the, the UI, thread, and do the update. Does it actually kill the older uh, processes? They're not processes though, they're threads. They're threads. So if you have a thread and you type sleep, yep. sleep cover? Yep. The, here's your problem. What if it's holding a mutex? Things like that, yes? Yeah, exactly. Um, it, that's tricky. We, we can talk about that after the talk. Uh, because, yeah, I'm out of time already, I, I suspect. Okay, um, but anyway, in 29 lines of code, we've handled UI events, we've worked with time, we've handled race conditions, we've used multiple threads. So that's a busy 29 lines of code. It actually fits on one screen pool on GitHub. Okay. This I don't really have time for, but I just want to say in one word what two slides here have. Um, I didn't write a single line of C code. All of this is done with native call, okay? Including callbacks. This is how I call the GTK uh, signal thing. So when it gets an event, I toss it into a, uh, a supply. Okay, you can go and look at the code uh, if you want to see more of that. So let me wrap this up because I know that I'm, oh, oh it says one minute, oh wow. It said one minute for a while, right? That was three minutes ago, oh wow. <laughs> Go me, go me. Okay, so uh, I handled it asynchronously, sorry. So, <laughs> asynchronous things have traditionally been hard to, to deal with. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that now reactive programming gives us a, a paradigm where we can deal with different sources of reactive data in a, you know, a fairly nice way. We can compose them together. We can get a lot of the complexity, especially of timing and synchronization issues that kind of don't go away. Um, we can actually factor them out of everyday user's code, get them into a bunch of these nice methods. We have more that I haven't had time to show you. Uh, but uh, really, I, you know, the sort of philosophy here is make the easy asynchronous things easy. Um, you know, getting a bit of stuff done on a background thread and getting it back on the UI should not be too hard. Um, here, I think we've made that a good bit easier. The code is uh, over there, okay? If you want to harass me afterwards, that is how to find me, or I'm around all day. Um, I would love to do questions, but I'm out of time, so find me at lunch or break or something like that. Thank you very, very much.